Good evening, I'm Chastity Cofield, and I am a performing arts senior from Atlanta, Georgia. In Lovecraft country, monsters lie in every corner and crevice. They come in all forms from the slimy and otherworldly to the truly evil plague of racism and bigotry, diseases that still take hold in our contemporary world. Battling these foes with dignity is Journey Smollett. It's the same cool monster of repeated history that she faced down in the powerful series Underground and the one she speaks out passionately against in her personal life. As Letitia Lewis, Smollett brings cool wit to a horrifying world. She stands toe to toe with whatever winds attempt to knock her down and her perseverance is truly an inspiration. I watch Smollett and feel the power of true bravery, authentic strength and timeless heroism. She embraces stories and themes that are inherently disorienting, critical and sometimes heartbreaking, but in that stir, we all come out stronger. Let's take a look. You just gonna stand there, Tick? Or you gonna help me? Lady Lewis. <laughs> Not only my friends get to call me that. Wait, you coming with us? Part way. The Bible is full of demons, and monsters. All this time, I've been chasing faith when I should have been discovering it in myself. Ladies and gentlemen, Distinguished Performance Award honoree, Journey Smollett. Congratulations. Oh, wow. Chastity, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, SCAD, for this beautiful award. I, I'm, I'm truly so honored. I mean, uh, your president, Paula Wallace, the the SCAD students, you've always been so supportive of me and my work and honored us during underground. And again, to receive this um, distinguished performance award means so much coming from you. And, you know, playing Letty Lewis has been a dream for me and to see how folks have responded to it is quite humbling. Um, I mean, I just feel so grateful to have worked with folks like our mad scientist, Misha Green, our creator, showrunner, writer, producer, um, who uses the art of storytelling to really illuminate the humanity, humanity of black folks and to have the support of Jordan Peele and JJ Abrams and HBO and Warner Brothers and to work alongside masters at their craft like Jonathan Majors and Courtney B. Vance and Michael K. Williams and Anjanu Ellis and Wu Mi and uh, Jamie Chung and Abby Lee and Jada, you know, it's, it's, it's really a project that is food for my soul. And to be a part of a show like this that feels disruptive um, and to be recognized by you means the world. So thank you, thank you. And so much love to you all, Mwah. thank you. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Ad ATV Fest. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Chancellor Agard, and I'm a staff writer for Tantrum Weekly, and I am so happy to be here talking with Journey Smollett, the star of HBO's Lovecraft Country. Um, hi, Journey, and congratulations again on your award. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you so much. Um, it's funny, I feel like this award couldn't, uh, this, this award, you're obviously getting it for Lovecraft Country, but I think it also sort of applies to your entire several decades long career, um, going back to, <laughs> going back to sort of um, Eve's Bayou. Um, I think before you get to Love the Country, I do you wanna jump back a bit and talk about some of sort of the important steps you've taken on along the way throughout your career? Because I think they can be, um, in person as a fan, I just I find them very inspirational. Um, I've learned a lot from watching. So I guess I wanna start with, um, with Eve's Bayou a bit. Cause I remember uh, you told my colleague Sarah Rodman over the summer, how that project sort of uh, was sort of the moment where you went from sort of doing acting as sort of like a hobby sort of thing to mm -hmm. like wanting mm -hmm. to do it as a career. I'm, I'm curious, I mean, what was it about that movie that sort of changed your sort of perspective on, on the craft? 
it's funny. Um, I remember the actual moment. There's a moment in the film when I'm I'm in the scene. It's a scene with me and my father, played by Samuel L. Jackson, and um, I'm asking him, you know, why is he never, why does he never choose to dance with me? I just witnessed him cheating on my mother, and you know, there's a lot of subtext to it. But as a child, that's what she's choosing to ask, right? Um, and there's a moment when I hugged him and um, my, my instinct was that this, it's hard to describe what happened in, in me, but it, it was a feeling of being present. Um, and in the hug, I didn't want to show him um, what I was really feeling. So when I hug him, I was able to, um, I don't know, it's hard to describe it. But I just remember being able to think as the character. It was the first time it really had happened to me. There was a, a, a presence, being fully present in that character and being able to think like Eve that, oh, I'm hiding what I'm really feeling from him, but when I hug him, I can actually let my guard down. And I remember thinking, I don't know, it's almost like a high that you experience as an actor when you're able to be fully present and truly disappear into the character. Um, it's so hard to describe, it's hard to put it in words and any attempt to put it in words only kind of negates it um, and diminishes the impact that it has on you. And you're constantly searching for it. Sometimes you, you achieve it and sometimes you don't, unfortunately. But the, the seeking, the knowing that it's there, that it could be achieved is what continues to drive me. And it's what clicked in me of like, oh no, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just this reality of doing. I mean, I guess that's what Meisner calls it, right? Just being able to disappear into the reality of doing. It's, um, it's, it's therapeutic. It's, um, I don't know. I just felt the calling, you know, I just, there's a knowing and it happened to me during that time. Yeah. And I remember also sort of moving forward your career a bit because I remember reading at one point you were sort of uh, really focused on movies and sort of you had this sort of not like a no TV rule, but you were just, uh, you didn't see yourself in TV as much um, until Friday Night Lights came along. But I'm curious for you, I mean, what was it that sort of initially sort of kept you away from television um, in those years? The roles, you know, um, just, just feeling frustrated and, um, you know, not only frustrated, but I don't know, kind of angry at um, the type of roles that I was, I was getting offered or auditioning for. Um, they just weren't very um, stimulating for me as an artist. They weren't challenging. Oftentimes it was the best friend or um, the girlfriend, um, which I'm fine playing those roles if they actually have agency in them, but. And like, and like an interior life to them, right? An inner struggle, you know, an interior life, a, a, a world, right? Not just the, just not just like a lazy mechanism for the writer to push the plot forward. Um, and so it, yeah, I mean, there was a real revolution that happened in television for women, for black women, um, Obviously, Shonda Rhimes was on the front lines of that. Um, but but yeah, Friday Night Lights was the first thing where um, the character was interesting to me. And I, I, I appreciated the show, the writing. Um, Pete Berg, when I auditioned for him, he read with me. And it was a, it was a total improv, you know, just about football and having brothers. And he went at me and I went at him and it was thrilling. And afterwards he gave me five. He was like, you're a fucking incredible actress. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> um, so I've kind of 
you know, just gone and leaned into characters and storytellers. Yeah. Um, and so it's not really that I swore off either narrative format. It was the storytellers, once they came, once they were there, once the characters were there, that's when I leaned into TV more and, and honestly kind of leaned out of film. Um, but I don't, I don't have a preference one or the other. It's, it's, yeah. I lean into storytellers and characters. It's literally that simple for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and with, I mean, with Friday, with Friday Night 2, I mean, that show uh, was such a remarkable show for many reasons. One reason was the way that it was shot and the way that it was filmed and the way that like you guys didn't rehearse, you didn't, uh, there, 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 there was a lot of improvisation. I mean, what was it, what, what was that experience like for you and what did you sort of learn from shooting a show that way? Oh, I learned so much. It gave me an incredible amount of freedom. Um, for one, the other actors, um, you know, Jesse Plemons and and um, Michael B. Jordan and, you know, Coach. I mean, mm -hmm. I love that man so much. Um, and and Jason Kadams, our, our um, creator and showrunner, um, was incredibly encouraging. Um, he, he encouraged this level of freedom that was like unprecedented for me. Um, and he said to me, he said, Journey, I mean, I am not gonna be able to tell you how a 16 year old black girl is gonna behave. You know, I gotta take the lessons from you. Like you tell me. And it was so powerful of a, of a statement for him to make that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it empowered me and I ran with it, you know? But yeah, we didn't have rehearsals. We shot like 12 pages every day and the cameras just went up three cameras at a time and every take was different. And, you know, I remember sometimes I'd just be like to Mike or Jesse. So yeah, I'm not, let's not start it this way. Or how about we start, you know, and it was, it literally was, um, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it felt like we were just in like acting school or something, you know, just in class and, the amount of freedom was very liberating. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Friday Night Lights and then also Parenthood and True Blood, you had this period of time where you were sort of just jumping into these very popular shows that were already in the full swing of things, sort of deep into their runs. Um, as an actress, what is it like to sort of jump into a situation like that where you're coming in, the machine's already moving and sort of having to sort of find your place and carve out your own space in, that, um, in those shows, I guess? It's very challenging because the thing about these projects, they all, you kind of become a family with, mm -hmm. with your cast, with your crew. And, and so you're really kind of jumping into a well-oiled machine, a, an already established family. Um, I've been fortunate because so many times um, when I was jumping into those projects, I received such warm welcomes, you know, um, Parenthood. One, it's it was kind of some of the crew from Friday Night Lights, you know, mm -hmm. Jason Adams and his team. And so it was such a warm welcome there. Um, but also in times, I just kind of would use it, um, you know, that outsider feeling. Mm -hmm. If your character is just being introduced, oftentimes your character is the outsider, you know? Um, and so like with True Blood, my character for sure was an outsider and coming and penetrating this world that was very foreign for her. Mm -hmm. um, so you just try to use it in, in a way. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is its own unique muscle um, to come into a, an established show in that way. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I mean, we move on to Underground, which is sort of uh, the first of show where you're the lead character uh, from Jump as an adult, um, and that's when you met Misha Green, who created Lovecraft Country. Uh, and I know that we've talked about how your relationship with Misha Green didn't get up on a great foot at, um, in the pilot stage. I'm curious, I mean, I feel like people, people, especially students, would find it interesting. Can you talk about how that working relationship with Misha sort of evolved over the course of Underground to the point where you guys could take on both a harrowing show like Underground for two seasons and then do, then do, then do something just as sort of emotionally trying as Lovecraft Country? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because 
when I was um, cast, Misha and Joe and Anthony Hemingway had me come in and read with the different versions of Noah. And yeah. <laughs> in the screen test, Misha grabs my hand and whispers very in a very creepy tone, we're gonna be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, you know, and yeah, it couldn't have been more the opposite on the pilot of Underground. Um, and it was a lot of the, a lot of the contention was surrounding this one scene, um, the whipping scene in which Rosalie sacrifices herself for her little brother. And I was honest with her and saying, I didn't feel it was on the page, right? Mm -hmm that the scene wasn't there. And we had practiced it and over rehearsed it and talked it, debated it until we were blue in the face. And she and I couldn't have been on more like opposite sides about how to approach this scene. And I'm coming with all this research, you know, of like, well, yeah, yeah. but this is how they did it. Yeah, but this is what would have happened. Or yeah, but like instinctively your body would run or you do this, like all these, you know, I'm arguing with her that this scene is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then physically, everything I'm doing, she's telling me, no, that ain't it. No, that ain't it. <laughs> it was also her first time being a showrunner, my mm -hmm. first time, you know, leading a show. And it's a, it's a very heavy topic and we both, the unspoken thing was that we both felt the pressure of mm -hmm not screwing this up, you know, of doing justice to the story of, in trying to tell essentially a prison break story about some superheroes in the environment of the 18, 18, uh, 50s, right? Mm -hmm. That's not an easy task. Um, and so we just kept butting heads. And finally on the day when, when it came for us to shoot the scene, I said to Anthony, our director, I said, don't talk to me about this scene. And the only thing I ask is just don't let me hear the sound of the whip because we've over discussed it. And the only thing I can hold on to in order to keep it fresh is the sound of the whip. And I haven't heard that. So just, I, just give me that one thing. And I mean, honestly, I didn't know what, what I was gonna do when I, when the camera started rolling, I just, I literally prayed to the ancestors and was like, please just use me. And boy, a spirit took over me. And it's the thing, it's the thing about art. It's like, you can't, you just gotta trust and surrender, you know? Um, and Anthony just let the cameras roll and we did it a few takes and after, I couldn't stop shaking, I couldn't stop crying. And Misha came over and her and Anthony and Aldis hugged me for probably like 10 minutes. And it was a real breakthrough for Misha and I in understanding that I have to trust what's on the page and mm -hmm. she has to trust me. Mm -hmm. And if I just surrender, if we both just surrender to it, there's gonna be, a, there's gonna be another element that will show up that we can't rehearse, that you can't plan for, right? Um, and so, yeah, we, you know, did become really close friends and the collaborative spirit, um, was just like a, a tunnel. I mean, it was like a, an ocean wave, like, you know, it just flooded, um, and the gates opened up and we learned each other's love language. So by the time Lovecraft came about, it was second nature on set. You know, it had been technically the third season of TV um, mm -hmm. we had done. Season two, I was pregnant. Season two of yeah. Underground, <laughs> I was pregnant, okay? Running through the woods. And <laughs> Running alive. through the woods, pregnant. She had to rewrite the whole season. <laughs> like, you know, by then, by Lovecraft, she and I had been through so much. Mm -hmm. um, personally, artistically, we grew as artists, she grew as a showrunner and understanding how to talk to actors. I grew in my art, you know, in understanding how to shoulder, you know, the pressure more. Um, yeah, so Lovecraft came, I didn't even really have to, it was like, I know this, I know, I know, what she, I know this, you know, and she knows that I got it, you know. Um, 
yeah, so it's been a very fruitful collaborative relationship. Um, and one of the things about Misha is she will push you past your boundaries. And that's it's why I keep coming back and keep being hungry to work with her on these projects because she just, her writing's unparalleled, you know? Um, she, she writes our narratives in a way that's very radical. And as an artist, I mean, you're pushed to your limits and then pushed past it, you know? And she wants you to lean into the stuff that makes you uncomfortable. And for me, it's so thrilling. Um, you mentioned in there I mean, the, 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 the idea of surrendering to the work. Um, I feel like that's a word uh, that I feel like uh, really applies to what you guys did on Lovecraft Country. I mean, again, you're uh, another again, sort of harrowing story that's that, yes, it's set in the 1950s, but it, it feels just as timely. It would have been timely whenever the show aired because because you because you because because you're so because because you're so issues that we're dealing with in this country in terms of race. Um, and this episode that, that aired before this panel, episode three, is one of those moments uh, I think where I think where I where I think um, that this idea of surrendering comes into place, where you and Atticus are having this exorcism in the basement, um, mm -hmm. sort of helping these these victims of sort of medical racism, um, which is sort of very powerful to watch. For you, what was it like to sort of shoot that sequence and to sort of prepare for that and do it? Um. Yeah, it was a it was another one of those moments where you can't plan it, you know, mm -hmm. you can't um over rehearse it. You just have to surrender to it. I the only thing I asked Misha, I said, um, you know, we're 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 performing an exorcism and a ritual, Misha. I said, I'm all for authenticity, but like um the language and stuff we're we're speaking. I mean, can it? Can we just change some words so it's not actually real? Like, I don't want to really exercise them. Both. Okay, like, you know, I mean, listen, I spoke to my pastor. Mm -hmm. I had rituals. I was like, blood of Jesus is gonna cover me. No, but honestly, it was. It 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 was about just keeping it personal. Mm -hmm. If I, you know, I knew if I just kept it personal. This is, the stakes are so high for Letty. She is fighting for her life. She's not just fighting to exercise these spirits that are trapped in her house. These men and women who have been tortured, um, you know, the anarchists of the world. She's not just fighting to free them. She's fighting to free herself. You know, when she says, you're not dead yet, you can still fight. Letty is saying that to herself as well as to them. Um, and I know what that's like. I so know what it's like to feel like a ghost in your house. I know what it's like to have to face, feel like you are facing the devil head on and having, feeling like you have to fight in this spiritual warfare. It is so familiar to me, man, when I tell you, um, and, and especially it's interesting how projects come to me oftentimes, um, they line up with real things I'm going through in my own life. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was for sure, yeah, one of those moments where I just knew I had to sacrifice my mind, my body, and my spirit and surrender to something bigger than me in order for it to work. Um, it was a calling of the spirit. It was um, a bit terrifying to step into it because I didn't, when you surrender, you're like, yeah, but I'm stepping into kind of dark forces, you know, and, and I am surrendering and exposing myself and allowing my body and my spirit to be taken over by Letty in this moment. Right. And so, um, yeah, it took a lot of trust that the story we're telling is a mighty story. Mm -hmm. which I believed I wouldn't do these things. I wouldn't sacrifice and surrender of my body in this way, of my spirit in this way, if I didn't feel that it was in service to something bigger than myself. And I believe that with Lovecraft and I, we all believed it with Lovecraft. Um, we, we felt that it was a mighty story to tell. 
Um, and so in that way, you just trust that you'll break your heart, but hopefully the spirit will put it back together at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, the show, uh, on one hand, you have these scenes where you guys sort of are going to Emmett Till's funeral and or traveling back to the Tulsa massacre in 1921. Um, on the other hand, I think one of the great things about the show, it, 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 it does a good job of, of honoring the sort of weight of those moments, of those dark parts of our history, then also, it also makes a point of also depicting uh, black people experiencing moments of joy, whether that's Courtney B. Vance and Anjanu in what, like one of the first shots of the pilot is them in bed together, or yeah. you or you and Jonathan Majors, or are you performing with your sister. Uh, for you, I guess, I guess, did you find those moments necessary for yourself as the actor as a way to sort of decompress from the heavier material that you guys were dealing with on a more daily, or like on, on, on like, I guess on daily, daily you know it's less about decompressing and more so about just telling the truth mm -hmm. because black folks you know while we've endured yes very tumultuous times we've also struck str we strive on a daily to seek joy and seeing black joy portrayed on screen is a very radical act to me, but also an essential act because it's just the truth. We're not just one thing. We're not just the tragedy. And, you know, it frustrates me sometimes when sometimes our stories are told in a way where they're so one-sided and it's so heavy. It's like, that's just not the truth. You know, yeah. we, our standing today, we are the embodiment of survivors. We stand on the shoulders of these kings and queens who survived. How do they survive? Not just through the fight, but through the joy as well, right? Through the laughter, through the cooking the, the meals. And even though we're only given the scraps, we gonna make some <laughs> bomb ass chitlins and some gumbo out of these scraps that we are given, right? Like that spirit of triumph is in us. And so I think we do a disservice when we do not tell the entirety of who we are as a people, right? When we do not express our, our joy on screen, when the stories are so heavy, it's just not the truth to me. Um, and so it's less about, yeah, it's less about me as an artist, what I need, and more about what the, the story needs and servicing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, one moment in particular uh, that it, it really stood out to be in the show is sort of in the finale where you guys are on the way to the uh, to the big sort of climax, and it's just you guys sitting in the car singing along to um, I think it's Shaboom um, or oh, Life yeah. Would Be a Dream. Uh, yeah. I, I, know, I know that I guess in the grand scheme of things, it's such an insignificant. It might be a rather rather insignificant moment for me. Again, I love that. I would love to hear if you talk about like what was it like shooting such a lighthearted scene. <laughs> With, with the cast. It was great. We were literally just in the car. You know, they had some some cameras mounted and then some cameras outside and we just driving back and forth. Jonathan's driving, We you know, and it just felt real. It just felt honest. It just felt, it didn't feel forced or anything like that. It felt like, you know, what else are you gonna do in this car? I mean, yeah. mope? Yeah, you mope a little bit, you you feel dread, you feel terror, you feel fear. But a song comes on and the little baby in the back, D, you know, she kicks it off. And it's like, okay. You know, and 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 I again I think that's just the truth of life. Um and it's it's one of my favorite moments in the finale as well. It was one of my favorite moments to shoot. It was also one of the few moments we're all together. Um, so it was a it was a lot of fun. It was just good fun. Um, and I'm curious, looking back at Lovecraft Country, what I guess what I guess what are you I guess what did you take away from from being on this show, and what I guess what I guess what did you learn from this experience that 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 you hope to apply to future pro projects? I mean, I I think for sure I'm always hungry to grow mm -hmm. and to walk away from a project feeling like I grew, I was stretched beyond my limits. And that for sure happened, um, you know, 
the amount of endurance that this project required because we shot it over a course of eight months. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's it's like running a long distance marathon. You got to keep your endurance up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, there's a real, it's funny because I left the project being like, I, I I don't ever, I don't ever think I could do another season of this show ever again. Like I was so, you know, I cut my hair because I was like, I would just want to purge myself of Letty. Um, and then now I'm like, oh, I miss Letty. I would really love to go back and like shoot the guy, you know. <laughs> um, but I think the beautiful thing about art is, um, especially this kind of art, you know, in which you're illuminating the humanity of Black folks. You know, the art, because I think too often the erasure of Black folks is so prevalent, mm -hmm. the erasure of our stories. Um, and so it it feel it felt so incredibly satisfying to be a part of something like this, um, because you find joy when you when you feel like you're used for a purpose that's bigger than yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I just like disrupting shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Lovecraft, you know, especially the way in which Misha has like deconstructed this classic genre and like flipped it on its head. And, you know, it's Lovecraft, it's yeah. Lovecraftian, right? But not. And so I, I feel, um, yeah, man, I just feel grateful. With that, I and just to wrap up because we're almost at time. Um, I want to with 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 that idea of disruption again. Again, you've been in in I'm in, in, um, in, in this industry for so long, um, and I know that you've talked about wanting wanting to do a musical at some point. But I'm curious, have you ever given any thought to directing or producing or writing as another way of sort of creating in this industry? Absolutely, I'm currently um, producing several projects, which I'm very excited about. Um, <laughs> And it's a different muscle to explore um, different side of your brain almost, you know. Um, but I am so excited because it's it's an opportunity to champion new voices forward and new stories forward. So absolutely, um, that's part of my mission is being one of the folks who can just help shepherd our stories forward. Um, and you know, I can't wait to be able to talk about some of them because some of them are just so thrilling and exciting. And some of the folks I'm collaborating with, it's just, I mean, like, pinch me, pinch me, you know. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm, I'm definitely on a mission to um, shepherd more of our stories forward. Not all of them I'll have to be in either, you know. Mm -hmm. I, um, I just want to be one of the disruptors, you know. Awesome. Um, well, that's all the time we have today. Uh, Journey, thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank Again, you. congratulations on your award. And thank you to everyone uh, watching at home. And please continue enjoying SCAD ATV Fest. Thank you so much.